business adventures. Eventually, Mrs. Sauce went back to her seat and everybody calmed down. The rest of the meeting given over largely to questions and comments from amateur stockholders rather than professional ones, was certainly less lively than what had gone before and not noticeably higher in intellectual content. Stockholders from Grand Rapids, Detroit, and Ann Arbor all expressed the view that it would be best to let the directors run the company. Although the Grand Rapids man objected mildly that the Bell telephone hour couldn't be received on television in his locality anymore, a man from Pleasant Ridge, Michigan, spoke up for retired stockholders who would like AT&T to blow less of its earnings back into expansion so that it could pay higher dividends. A stockholder from rural Louisiana stated that when he picked up his telephone lately, the person didn't answer for five or ten minutes. I bring it to your attention. The Louisiana man said, and Mr. Kappel promised to have somebody look into the matter. Mr. Davis raised a complaint about AT&T contributions to charity, giving Mr. Kappel the opportunity to reply that he was glad the world contained people more charitable than she. Tax-exempt applause. A Detroit man said, I hope you won't let the abuse you've been subjected to be, to buy a few malcontents keep you from bringing the meeting back to the great Midwest again. It was announced that Dr. Arkin had been defeated for a seat on the board since she received a vote of only 19,106 shares against some 400 million proxy votes included for each candidate of the manager slate. By approving the manager slate, a proxy voter can in effect oppose a, f- a floor nomination even though he knows nothing about it. And that was how the 1966 annual meeting of the world's large company went or how it went until 5.30 when all but a few hundred stockholders had left and when I had it for the airport to catch a plane back to New York. The AT&T meeting left me in a thoughtful mood. Annual meetings, I reflected, can be time to try the soul of an admirer of representative democratic government, especially when he finds himself guilty, sympathizing with the chairman who is being badgered from the floor. The professional stockholders in their wilder moments are management's secret weapon, a, miss, a missus Sauce and Mr. Davis at their most strident could have made Commodore Vanderbilt and uh, Pierpont Morgan seem like a a fable old gentleman and they can make a latter day magnet like Mr. Capel seem like a hang packed husband if not actually a champion of stockholders rights. At much moments, the professional stockholders become, from a practical standard point, enemies of intelligent dissent. On the other hand, I thought they deserve sympathy too, whether or not one believes they have right on their side, because they are in the position of representing a constituency that doesn't want to be represented. It's hard to imagine anymore more reluctant to claim his democratic rights or more suspicious of anyone who tries to claim them for him and dividend fattened stockholder. And of course, most stockholders are thoroughly divided fattened these days. Beryl speaks of the state of stockholding as being by its nature passive receptive rather than the managing and creating most of the AT&T stockholders in Detroit. It seems to me we are so deeply devoted to the notion of the company as Santa Claus that they were beyond passive receptivity to active cupboard love, and the professional stockholders I felt had taken on an assignment almost as thankless as that of recruiting for the Young Communist League among the junior executives of the Chase Manhattan Bank. In view of Chairman Philippe's warning to general electric stockholders at Schenectady, in 1965 and of the report about the company's hardline task force it was with a sense of being engaged in hot 
pursued that I boarded a, a southbound Pullman for the General Electric annual meeting. This one held in Atlantis Municipal Auditorium, a snappy hall, the rear of which was brightened by an interior garden complete with trees and lawn. And in spite of the fact that it was held on a luxurious rainy southern spring morning, more than a thousand GE stock holders turned out, as far as I could see, three of them were Negroes. And it was not long before I saw another of them were Mr. Sauce. However, express exasperated he may have become the previous year in Schenectady, Mr. Philippe, who all conducted the 1966 meeting, was in perfect control of himself and of the situation this time around. Whether he was exp expatiating on the wonders of GE balance sheet and its laboratory discoveries or spark sparring with the professional stockholders, he spoke in the same season, sing-song way, delicately trading the thin line between patient, careful exposition and irony. irony. Mr. Sachs, in his Hard Business Review article, had written, Top executives are finding it necessary to learn how to lessen the adverse impact of the few disruptors of the majority of share owners, while simultaneously enhancing the positive effects of the good things which do take place in the annual meeting. And having learned sometime earlier that the same Mr. Sachs had been engaged by GE as an advisor on stockholder relations. I couldn't help suspecting that Mr. Felipe's performance was a demonstration of Saxonism in action. The professional stockholders, for their part, responded by adopting precisely the same ambiguous style. And the resulting dialogue had the general air of conversation between two people who have quarreled and then decided not quite wholeheartedly it to make it up. The professional stockholders might have demanded to know how much money GE had spent in the interest of keeping them under control, but they missed the chance. One of the exchanges in this vein achieved a touch of witness, of witness, uh, witness Mr. Sauce, speaking here in her sweetest tone, called attention to the fact that of the board of directors candidates Frederick L. Hovde, president of Purdue University and former chairman of the Army Scientific Advisory Panel, on only 10 shares of GE stock, and said she felt that the board should be made up of more substantial holders, whereupon Mr. Philippe pointed out just as sweetly that the company had many thousands of holders of 10 fewer shares, Mr. Sauce among them, and suggested that perhaps these small holders were deserving of representation of the board by one of their number. Mr. Sauce had to concede a fine stroke of chairmanship, and she did, on another matter, although the quorum was stringently, stringently maintained by both sides, outward accord was less complete. Several stockholders, Mr. Sauce among them, had formally proposed that the company adopt for its director elections the system called cumulative voting, under which a stockholder may concentrate all the votes he is entitled to on a single candidate rather than spread them over the whole state slate, and which therefore gives a minority group of stockholders a much better chance of electing on a representative to the board. Cumulative voting, though a subject of controversy in big business circles, for obvious reasons, is nevertheless a perfectly respectable idea. Indeed, it is mandatory for companies incorporated in more and more in more than 20 states, and it is used by some 400 companies listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Nevertheless, Mr. Felipe did not find it necessary to answer Mrs. Sauce's arg argument for cumulative voting. He chose instead to stand on a brief company stand on this subject that, he ha that had been previously mailed out to stockholders. The main point of which was the presence of the GE board as a result of commodity voting of representatives of special interest groups might have a divisive and disruptive effect. Of course, Mr. Felipe did not say he knew, as he doubtless did know that the company had in hand and enough proxies to defeat the proposal. Some companies like, anim like some animals have their private highly specific specialized gut flies who harass them, nobody else, and General Eldrick is one. In this sense, the, the gut lie was Louis Abusati of Chicago, who was company meeting over the past 13 years, had advanced 31 proposals, 
Polish had been defeated by a vote of at least 97% to 3%. Atlanta, Mr. Brusati, a gray-haired man, built like a football player, was it at the game? Not with proposals this time, but with questions. For one thing, he wanted to know why Mr. Philip personal holdings of GE stock listed in the proxy statement now were 423 shares, fewer than they had been a year ago. Ms. Reed replied that the difference represents shares that he had contributed to family trust funds and added mildly that, but with emphasis, I could say it, it's none of your business. I believe I have a right to the privacy of my affairs. There was more reason for mildness than, than the emphasizes. As Mr. Broussard did not fail to point out, in impeccably, unemotional, monotone, many of Mr. Phillips' shares had been acquired under op- options of preferential, preferential prices and not available to others. And moreover, the fact that the Mr. Philip precise holdings and being, including the proxy statement, clearly showed that in the opinion of the Securities and Exchange Commission, his holdings were Mr. Brusati business. Going on the matter on the fees paid directors, Mr. Brusati elicited from Mr. Philip the information that the, over the past seven years this had been raised from $2,500 per annum, first to $5,000 and then to $7,500. Then ensuing dialogue between the two men went like this. By the way, who established those fees? So those fees are established by the board of directors. The board of directors established their own fees? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brustat. Later in the, in, the, in the morning, there were several lengthy and eloquent orations by stock hosts on the virtues of General Electric and of the South, but this rather elegantly elect, elliptical exchange with Mr. Broussard and Mr. Philippe is stuck in my mind, where it seemed to sum up the spirit of the meeting only after adjournment, which came at 12.30 following Mr. Philippe's announcements that the unopposed slate of directors had been elected and that cumulative voting had lost by 97.51% to 2.49%. Did I realize that not only the, had there been no stamping, booing, or shouting as there had been in Detroit, but regional pride had not had to be invoked against the professional stockholders?